Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you all to our third um, Women's on the Margins lecture series, um, which goes and follows along um, with um, my course on governing the mosaic, Israel minority politics in Israel. And today, um, and I would like to, this is a, an event brought to you by the YNS um, Nazarian Center for Israel Study with co-sponsorship with the UCLA Center for African Studies and the UCLA Center for the Study of International Migration. Thank you all for joining us. Please feel free to ask questions all throughout um, the um, lecture. Um, you, you would see the Q&A box directly to the Q&A box. Um, and now I would like to introduce um, Dr. Shanipa Artubia, who is a dear friend and a wonderful scholar and fierce, fearless and forceful um, activist. Um, Shani, Bar Shani manages the policy advocacy of the Israeli Refugee Rights Forum, which is a forum composed of six human rights organizations, um, ASAF, Aid Organization for Refugee and Asylum Seekers in Israel, the Hotline for Refugee and Migrants, Physicians for Human Rights in Israel, the Workers Hotline, Kav Laoved, ARDC and the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, also known as ACRI. Shani received her PhD from the Hebrew University in International Relations with um, conjunction with Free Universität from Berlin. And she has written about asylum policies of what she names so-called Western countries with a focus on Israel. Um, she also taught um, undergraduate courses um, on this topic at the Hebrew University and has been a volunteer during her PhD years um, at the Jerusalem African Community Center. Um, Shani will um, introduce us today to the plight of African migrants um, in Israel and specifically Eritrean um, women in Israel. I'm very excited to have Shani. Shani um, agreed to, kindly agreed to uh, participate and join us despite being eight months pregnant and having a very difficult day today in Israel um, with missiles. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're very, very excited to have you. And Shani, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also very happy to be here. I see that my internet connection is not perfect. Please, Tamar, let me know if there's if there are issues. I'm sorry for that. Um, and yes, I'm sorry also if there will be an alarm. I might need to go and get my uh, my daughter here to the room. Um, of course, I want to mention that this time the round started by Israel's attack on Gaza yesterday that killed uh, uh, children and women and uh, the missiles today are a reaction for that. And um, I really hope that, uh, yeah, this round of violence will not be as um, costly as previous ones. Um, so today, uh, let me share my screen. We are here to talk about um, African refugees in Israel. Why am I not on the first page? Let's start on the first page. It's always preferable. Um, we're talking about refugees in Israel, African refugees in Israel, and specifically Eritrean refugees in Israel, which is the biggest uh, group of uh, refugees in Israel. Until recently, um, Israel had almost only African refugees, but uh, since a year ago, now there are also uh, Ukrainian refugees in Israel. Um, and uh, including Ukrainian women, many of the vulnerabilities that we will talk about today, of course, apply also to Ukrainian women. But I do want to focus uh, on the group of Eritrean women, which are in Israel and they're uh, disprivileged or um, uh, marginalized position already for uh, 15 years, some of them, uh, and uh, at the very least for 10 years. So we're talking about a very, very long period of time, very pro protracted um, uh, uh, limbo situation, legal limbo, social limbo. We will uh, talk about all of these things. And I think the time does have uh, a meaning. And I hope that I will manage to, um, to illustrate how. Um, and why only Eritrean and not, and not other groups, simply like Sudanese. Um, uh, there are quite a few Sudanese refugees in Israel and as, well, as well, but most of them are men. 
So the group of, uh, of uh, Eritrean women refugees in Israel is, is simply the, the biggest group um, of African refugee women in Israel. And that's, this is why it will be our focus today. Um, I want to start by talking a bit about the past, about things that uh, you can't blame Israel for, you can't blame the host country for, uh, but are important to understand the background of these women and their uh, current suffering. Um, if we talk about Eritrean women specifically, talk about Eritreans in general, I, I, I hope, I believe that uh, most of you do know something about Eritrea being one of the worst dictatorships in the world, if not the worst in, in, some, in some aspects. It's worse than uh, North Korea um, in some of the international uh, you know, uh, ratings and, um, and measurements. And uh, the, the most well-known problem in Eritrea is the, uh, the enforced uh, military service that is basically not limited in time and is not really a military service. Uh, it was uh, recognized as some, by some international bodies and some states as uh, slavery. Um, and uh, it includes um, the disappearance of people and torture and uh, forced labor, as I said. And of course, you don't get to see home for years and years. You don't get, really get paid and um, uh, all sorts of other characteristics. And this one also has a specific gender aspect. If you meet an Eritrean woman that was in the Eritrean military, you can assume that there was some sort of sex uh, slavery involved, some abuse. Uh, so the, the military service also has uh, a gendered aspect. Of course, also when, when, when the woman uh, got married, just in order to try and avoid the military, this also has consequences. So it means that many of them became mothers in a very, very early age. This is also a gendered um, source of uh, uh, vulnerability from the home country. Not seeing their uh, uh, partners for, uh, for many, many months and uh, basically raising their kids alone, financial burdens, etc. Now the Apart from the situation in the home country, also the, the escape, the way to Israel, which for some of them was not out of choice. Some of them was, were uh, planning to get to other countries, were kidnapped from different uh, refugee camps uh, along the route. Some of them did plan to uh, arrive to Israel. But all of them, all of the, all of the women that arrived to Israel crossing uh, by foot uh, via this, the Sinai Desert, all of them uh, passed via Sinai and passed via the, um, uh, the the torture camps. So it depends on the period. There were, and, and here you see a poster of a film that I really don't recommend <laughs> that you will see unless you uh, unless you want to suffer. It's, it's it's horrible. It's a horrible film. It's basically an Eritrean Swedish uh, journalist that um, talks to the victims that are while filming the film are uh, in the torture camps um, trying to help them to gather the ransom money. So it really depends on the period. There were periods that it was really, really uh, bad, the situation in Sinan in the torture camps. And uh, you can know that if people came a bit later, so 2011, 12, around the Arab Spring years, then they suffered more. The ransom was higher. The periods of being in prison there were longer the torture was worse. So it, it depends on the period. Not all women, all Eritrean women that live in Israel were uh, raped in the, in the torture camps, but, but most of them or many of them. Um, and some of them as, as, as a um, quite long period of, of time. Some of them while having their kids with them. Um, so we're talking about uh, specific gender related, related persecution in the home country. We're talking about the, uh, the escape, which the journey is as always more dangerous for women. We're talking about the torture camps in Sinai that had a specific aspect for women. Maybe many of them um, came to arrive to Israel uh, while being pregnant with unwanted babies from, from, from these uh, months that they, uh, weeks or months that they spend in the torture camps. And the final aspect that I want to mention that is the, a gendered source of trauma before arriving to Israel is the, um, 
the sometimes the the necessity, the need out of no choice to leave their kids behind. So many women, um, we have a report from 2016, uh, ASAF has a report uh, based on interviews with 140 women. So in this report, quarter of the interviewees had children that they had to leave in Eritrea. So transnational mothering, if you wanna euphemize it, but basically uh, kids that, that, they, that they had to leave behind and that they haven't seen for between 10 and 15 years. I'm saying, by the way, between 10 and 15 years, there are no new Eritrean women in Israel because since 2013, the border with Egypt is closed. So um, it's uh, almost impossible to, to enter Israel uh, from Africa if you're unwanted. So if they, the, the last women that entered in 2012 are here for a decade. That's why I'm saying between 10 and, and 15 years. Um, so these are kind of... I'm, I'm doing it really because I want to uh, cover a lot. I'm doing it really shortly, but I will be happy to uh, any of, of these points. If you have uh, if you have questions, then please bring them up, and then we can uh, talk a bit further during the Q and A. So most of the Eritrean women that that are in Israel today, they bury they they carry the the the, the scars of of these aspects of the, the situation in the home country life under dictatorship, but specifically as, as women, life in the army, but specifically as women, and the scars of the, of the escape and of the difficult month long journey to Israel, the torture camps and the, um, the need to leave parts of their families uh, behind. And then they arrived to Israel. And now the, the, the next two slides um, I'm going to describe the policies, so it's not only about uh, the, the women, the, the refugee women that are living in Israel. Uh, it applies to all refugees that are living in Israel. But then I would want to go back to focusing on women and explain how these general no asylum policies, how they specifically um, and disproportionately affect women, why women suffer more. But first, suffer from what? Israel's policy since African asylum seekers started arriving here in, in large numbers, which started around 2006, uh, seven. Um, Israel's policy is quite stable in the sense of not wanting to uh, bluntly violate, violate the international law and deport them. So Israel does not deport them back to their home countries, and that's an official policy, but also not wanting to integrate them. So no deportation, but no integration. They are, um, and this is very clear by, has been very clear by all Netanyahu governments, which are almost the only governments that we had since uh, 2009. Um, it's, it's quite clear, it's quite official that they are not wanted here. Even after the border was sealed and no new people entered, and now the group is becoming smaller and smaller. Today, we're talking about only approximately 30,000 uh, African asylum seekers in Israel. So quite a small group. In the height, it was 60,000. 60, so even today, even after all these years, even when the group is smaller, it's, it's quite clear that they are not wanted here. I'm not going to go into explanations why. It's not my expertise. I, I'm willing to share my thoughts, of course, uh, during, during the Q&A. I, uh, I have my thoughts about this topic, but I've, I've never investigated um, the sources for the... Um, yeah, the, the treatment uh, or the attitude, the approach towards uh, refugees and asylum seekers in Israel. So what does this no asylum uh, policy include? First of all, it, it includes the attempt to prevent new people from coming. So it's the border fence, it's the cooperation with Egypt when this was possible to ask Egypt to stop them before, before even coming close to the border. It includes the um, um, the attempt to return people to Egypt, which are um, yeah a violation of international law. Uh, they call it the hot return. It's basically a violation of normal forma because uh, because Egypt was not safe. Um, Israel had an agreement with Egypt. It wasn't very successful, thank God. So something like seven hundred refugees, all in all, uh, during four years, I think that this agreement was in place were returned to Egypt. 
So that's in general the attempt to to prevent. Uh, again, I don't want to go too deep into it because we are mostly talking about the, the the women that are in Israel today, those that were not returned and that managed to enter. The second aspect of Israel's uh, non-asylum policy is removal. Removal is a word that Israel uses, harhaka, uh, which of course means deportation. But um, as I said, Israel is not deporting them officially to their home country and forcibly. Uh, this, this is a border that we didn't cross yet. To have Eritreans handcuffed uh, on boarding on an airplane and being forcibly um, uh, brought back to Eritrea or to Sudan or to Ukraine now. So uh, the, there is this uh, um, uh, official non-removal non, uh, non policy, non-removal to home country. But Israel has been putting pressures on the asylum seekers and uh, strong pressures since 2013 to voluntarily leave, including to home countries. Uh, here you see a, 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 like a flyer, brochure, whatever, publication of the, um, the uh, unit for voluntary uh, departure. It's the best functioning unit of uh, the Ministry of Interior. You can always get them on the phone. It's amazing. Uh, and it's, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, and it's been in place since 2013, actively encouraging, uh, trying to encourage refugees to agree to leave. So, um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is apart from removal to home countries, uh, because this didn't happen in large numbers as Israel was hoping, they in 2014 started removing people to what they call third countries. And I'm talking today mostly to Americans. So the US also have all sorts of uh, arrangements. We will talk in a second about the inspiration to all of the Israel's uh, ideas. Uh, but this idea that you can um, send people to countries that they didn't cross from, okay, that's a specific type of a third country agreement, to send people to countries that they have no connection to. Australia was the first to implement this. Israel was the second to try and implement this with Rwanda and Uganda. And the U.S. joined uh, during the Trump years. Uh, they were trying to send to uh, Guatemala, now I hope that I'm not confusing, to Guatemala, uh, to send refugees from the US to Guatemala, even if they were not Guatemalans or crossed via Guatemala. So even Mexicans were taken to Guatemala for a short period of time. Uh, this agreement was quickly uh, cancelled, but it was very interesting uh, after I was used to speak about Australia and Israel being so unusual in that respect, that they were willing to take the safe third country idea um, to take it to extreme, because it's not even a third country. This term was kept for countries that asylum seekers crossed via. For example, when Germany is returning refugees to Greece. Why? Because they crossed Greece on the way to Germany, okay? So this was the term safe third country until recently. The US also has uh, such an agreement with Canada, um, and did similar things with Mexico and with other countries. So this was the term safe third country until recently. And then Australia upgraded and started taking refugees, deporting refugees to countries that they had no connection to whatsoever. And then Israel, as I said, just now did with, uh, with Rwanda and Uganda. So it was really interesting that after two years that I was used to talking about this so much, about Australia and Israel being so unique, then, uh, then Trump, uh, Trump joined in. And um, uh, yeah, so Israel's attempt in 2018 to do it forcibly, not only to offer people to willingly, under a lot of pressures, incentives and disincentives to uh, go to Uganda and Rwanda, but also to forcibly uh, uh, fly people to Uganda and Rwanda, and those that refuse will go to prison. This attempt failed, okay? So officially, in the past few years, you can talk only about voluntary departure from Israel to either uh, home countries or to third, so-called third countries, Uganda and Rwanda. Um, and this uh, and another uh, destination, which doesn't need Israel's encouragement, uh, is Western countries, which actually has been the main destination in the past few years. So most asylum seekers that are leaving Israel 
I said that we had 60,000 uh, African refugees in the, in the peak, and now we have 30,000. Most of them left to uh, Western countries and first and foremost, Canada. Uh, via resettlement, official resettlement, governmental resettlement program, or private sponsorship, which is a very unique Canadian model that we can talk about also later. So um, that's the aspect of, of removal. So trying to get rid of those who did enter. Yes, sorry, Tama? When you refer to these numbers, these are the total refugees that came to Israel? This is a year or, or? No, no, it's the total. It's the total. It's a very small group. It's a total. In, in the peak, so the peak was 2013, let's say, the peak was 60,000 people, something like this. The numbers are all available online, but it was it it's, have been really low numbers. Before the Sudanese and Eritrean uh, arrival to Israel, in two, starting in 2006, before this, there were very, very few asylum seekers uh, coming to Israel to ask for asylum. They, they tried other countries. Um, there were few, se several hundreds of Ethiopians, and I'm talking about several hundreds, you know, for during a decade, since the, the 90s until 2006, and they were uh, taken care of by the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, and question from the audience um, mm -hmm. by Alifia um, Lapina. I'm sorry if I, I did not pronounce this correct, but um, the name correct. Um, she asks if you could please provide a bit more details about how Eritrean women exactly arrived to Israel, how they managed to escape and arrive. Um, like a, a little bit more, if you could explain a little bit more about how torturous this journey is. And So leaving Eritrea is in itself, uh, you know, not so easy. Uh, it's illegal basically to leave Eritrea and it's a risk for your life and for the people who help you. Um, so that's one aspect. Second, they need to cross many countries. Most of them, the, the typical route includes Sudan and Ethiopia and Egypt and uh, and then via Sinai into, into Israel. So it takes a couple of months. Uh, you stop on refugee camps on the way. Uh, and then when you are uh, in one of your uh, final countries, when you pass either Sudan or Ethiopia, uh, then you contact smugglers or they contact you and kidnap you. We, I also know personally stories like this. Uh, but let's say you contacted uh, smugglers, then they take you. Um, part of the, the, of course, it's, a, it's a, um, a network. So they move you from hand to hand sometimes. Part of the road is with uh, on Jeep, uh, Jeeps like uh, car vehicles. Part of the road is walking. The, the last couple of hundreds uh, of, uh, of uh, kilometers, a couple of uh, dozens of kilometers is always walking because the smugglers are not willing to, we're not willing to come to Israel's border, to come close to Israel's border. So also tragic stories about people that were just exhausted in the very last bit of the journey. Um, ah, and of, of course, before that, I forgot to mention the, the camps, the torture camps where the smugglers want to um, get their money. And uh, and demand ransom, and then they have all this uh, system that you can watch in the in the film that I recommend not to watch. <sighs> and another question from the audience by Ariel Olchansky. Um, Ariel is asking if um, if if women who are denied a, um, who are denied asylum, aside from the policies that you just um, discussed, are there consequences like punishment? Um, in certain countries after they return back or any other consequences once they return back or not return to their home country, but to a different third country? So in this, the, there is no connection between uh, um, the denial of status in Israel and the removal from Israel. The, um, the, it, we will get to it, but the asylum requests of all asylum seekers in Israel were either not examined or examined uh, of all African asylum seekers in Israel, either not examined for many, many years, and that's most of them, that's most of the cases, or a smaller number of requests were examined and rejected. These are the two options. Because you have, we have something like 20 Eritreans that managed to get refugee status uh, out of these tens of thousands, even though in other countries, Eritreans get recognized in very high rates, uh, over 90. Uh, in some years, 90%, 90% of Eritreans that uh, apply for asylum get it in Europe, uh, get some sort of protection. So 
it's pretty clear it's one of these countries that are, it's it's a pretty clear case and yet israel is really refusing to uh, fairly and efficiently examine their asylum requests and this is an important part because that's the, basically the ground base if their asylum requests would have been examined then uh, they would have gotten uh, some status in israel not the best one by the way but but some status not very stable but some status um and then all of the rest of my presentation would not have been relevant most of them don't and that's it actually brings me to the to the third point here they're making their lives miserable so if those that managed to enter and this is a quote of the minister of interior uh from 2012 Eli Shai, he said uh, as, as long as i can't deport them i will imprison them and i will make their lives miserable um i can repeat it in hebrew later if anyone is interested it's on a mariv uh, interview it's online so what does it mean how do you make them someone... i just have one comment chani um i just wanted to say to our audience that chani asked if there are questions that have to do especially with kind of elaborating a bit more to ask throughout the uh presentation and to feel free to ask them for the presentation so please um feel free if this are, if the if your questions are a little bit more elaborate we'll save them to the q a but if it's something that is more explanatory and it really ties into what we're talking about then shani wanted us to to ask that while we are um at the talk so yeah. just so everyone knows yeah because it's a topic that i've been dealing with for 10 years and sometimes i talk about it as if you know everybody know what i know about it so and i don't want to create a, such a situation so if if you need clarifications then then please do um ask it now and not during the q a otherwise please ask it during the q a so uh the making their lives miserable components so the, the base for it as i said is not uh, recognizing their their asylum requests but but once your asylum request is rejected or simply not examined for 10 years it doesn't mean that israel can't deport you it's not related these two things israel is not deporting eritreans period or sudanese as i said israel does not want the pictures of handcuffed Eritreans, especially women, by the way, taken forcibly on an airplane. This doesn't happen, and I don't want to jinx it because with the current government, it could happen next week that they decided that Eritrea is safe and there is no more protection from deportation. But right now, and for the past 15 years, there is protection from deportation. Okay, even if your asylum request was rejected, it doesn't mean that it's not a stressful situation. My friend Aster, who is working with us. In a staff, her uh, asylum request was rejected uh, a month ago, something like this, and she immediately thought that it means that she will be deported. She 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 didn't understand because the system is so. Are you allowed to say fucked up on a UCLA? Uh... <laughs> okay. Um. So the base for for the making their lives miserable component, and as, as I said, it's an official policy. This is even unfortunately a quote. Uh, is is not to uh, um, uh, positively uh, recognize them as refugees and um, and in general not to examine the asylum request, and that means that they don't have the status of recognized refugees in Israel. They are refugees, but not recognized refugees. So what do they have? What is this um, making their lives miserable? Uh, how does it look like in practice? And here I, I I put a picture of the of the visa that they do get. It's a unique visa, uh, a unique permit that was invented for them, 2A5 per permit, conditional release, as, as you see here uh, written in English, uh, which means that they are conditionally, re conditionally released from prison because you can't imprison them for uh, so many years because we still have uh, courts in Israel. And um, uh, so they are released from prison. They were imprisoned at the beginning. The, we had different times. Uh, Again, different attempts to keep them in prison. We don't have time to go into history in that respect, but they are released from prison. They are allowed to work. Um, today, they even, following a court process, of course, deleted the part here that says that this is not a work permit because this was a confusing sentence. Uh, it is not a work permit, but they are allowed to work. So uh, because this sentence caused a lot of confusion and, and troubles, uh, a successful court petition brought to uh, deleting it from their uh, from the from their permit so today the permit looks more or less like this but without this sentence that says that this is not a work permit and, um, and 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 this is the visa that they live with it's a piece of paper it doesn't even look like a, a proper visa that other types of uh, immigrants uh, get in israel 
and it doesn't give them almost any right apart from the right to uh, live here and the right to work here, but not, uh, but it's not an official right. Um, I will start with the employment situation then, because I already talked about it. Uh, it basically Israel doesn't want to give them work permits, but the court said to Israel, "Well, you need to make sure that the people can eat, if as long as you let them stay here." And then the state said, "Okay, until I will find another solution, I will not enforce the prohibition on employment." This was in 2000 and. 11 or 12, 11. It's been more than a decade uh, that the non-enforcement policy, this is the official name, is applied. Uh, and this is the way that they are employed under a non-enforcement uh, policy. Now the Ukrainians as well, by the way. Now the Ukrainians as well. Tamar, sorry, were you saying something? No, okay. Um, so that's the employment situation. Almost any other positive right, so something that the state doesn't need only to allow, but need to give social rights, uh, health uh, insurance, which is funny to say to, uh, to Americans, public health insurance, but in Israel, everybody has public health insurance. Uh, so they don't get it, the, the public health services. Um, welfare services. I will uh, touch on specific things in a, minute, in a minute when we will talk about the women again, but in general, most of the welfare services, uh, most of the allowances in Israel, they are closed to asylum seekers. So uh, health and welfare and access to higher education, driving license, almost, almost every, everything that you can uh, do in Israel, acquiring higher education, then they need to pay like foreigners and they have many other uh, obstacles on the way to acquire higher education. There are some professions in Israel, many professions in Israel, that you have to be a, a resident in order to, to work in these professions. So they are prevented from doing all this. It's basically living for 15 years uh, in a status that, that is supposed to be really, really temporary um, and that doesn't enable you to, to develop uh, your life and yourself. Um, in Israel. Um, another aspect of it is the, the bureaucracy, the bureaucratic maze, uh, what I call the bureaucratic maze. It's, uh, it's, it's basically living in Israel without an ID number is basically impossible. Uh, all of you who lived in Israel or who, who visited Israel know how often we use it in the gas station or to order sushi or to, to use, of course, your credit card. Uh, almost everything that you want to do in Israel, you need an ID number. Uh, so life for 15 years in this limbo situation. And that brings me to the question of, of how unique is Israel? Because I mentioned already the example of the safe third country agreements and that Israel was really not the first one to, to do that. And I want to say that the intentions, so not wanting spontaneous asylum seekers coming and asking for asylum and then getting it, this, this goal is shared by almost all Western countries in the past three decades. And it was not invented in Israel. Many of the specific measures were not invented in Israel. Some of the worst ideas, including this safe third country idea that I mentioned, were invented in Europe, were invented by Germany at the beginning of the 90s when Germany uh, coped with um, a rather large uh, number of uh, refugees from Yugoslavia and other countries, um, implemented by, again, some of these measures were implemented by many if not all of western countries of course the united states in some in some uh, periods of time australia is really really bad with refugees so the 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 measures um they are allegedly similar israel basically didn't invent anything but what makes them still unique is first of all the combination the combination of a non functioning asylum system so you don't have a way out of this situation with all of these restrictive measures against uh, asylum seekers, with very few rights for the very few people that were recognized as refugees. The combination of all of these aspects is unique. In Europe, they talk about hard from um, uh, outside, soft from within, so fortress Europe. This is, in migration studies, this is, this is a, already for a few decades now the popular term to, to frame the European policies. 
So many countries, they make uh, the, the lives of asylum seekers that want to enter quite difficult. But those that enter, they encounter uh, more or less, yeah? It, it, it changes from a country to country, but uh, functioning asylum system and a, 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 a clear set of rights for any for every stage of the of the process and you have people that are recognized as refugees and that manage to get status and build their lives etc in israel you don't have this so the, the the combination of of these measures the lack of the functioning asylum system and the longevity of the status you also have other countries that have uh, all of these temporary solution uh, leave to remain they call it in the uk in the US, they also have these group protections that are limited in years and stuff like this. But having a group of people, a big group of people, for so many years, having such a thin status that doesn't give them any social rights and any chance to get out of poverty and marginalization, this, this is unique. This, is, this puts the Israel in quite a unique situation. Um, and that brings me to the last, uh, I have I have to see like five minutes at least, right? Okay, so I wanna, I try to sketch it very, very roughly, the, the picture of what Israel has been doing with, with these refugees and what it hasn't been doing with these refugees for the past 15 years. And I wanna talk a bit about the consequences, where are the asylum seekers in Israel today, the refugees, and especially the women. So when we're talking about the, the, the the consequences of um, unregularized uh, employment with lack of social uh, assistance, with of course the past traumas and the persecution and the and background of migration in general. That's always of course uh, um, also uh, a factor. Um, when we're talking about the combination of all of these things, what does it create and why these consequences are more severe for women? So first of all, of course, first and foremost, it creates poverty. Asylum seekers in Israel, most of them are in, on some level of, of poverty. But of course, women suffer more. Whenever we talk about um, uh, lack of access to the employment market or challenges, women always suffer more, right? <laughs> even even in, um, uh, for, for us privileged women, it's when compared with privileged men, it's it's always more difficult. So we're talking about these women um, at the at the first two years, many of them took longer than the men to even start working at the beginning when they had very young kids. Then the men was mo were mostly working, and then they they joined later to the to the market. It means also later language acquisition. It means that they are more vulnerable if women. Uh, are uh, in charge of of uh, of raising the the children. It means that they are less flexible with the work that they can take. So in reality, most of these women they take works that are unskilled on one hand, but uh, as flexible as possible on the other, and that means cleaning. Most of the uh, women asylum seekers. This is the most common profession among uh, uh, women refugees in Israel. Um, they are more vulnerable to uh, exploitative uh, employment. Uh, of course, men as well, because of this situation of, of uh, non-regularized uh, work, uh, non-official work, and also no way of acquiring new opportunities to, to move to other professions. So of course, everybody are exposed to uh, exploitation, but women are more exposed to exploitation. Of course, women, unlike men, when we're talking about um, difficult poverty, like severe poverty and exploitation in the in the labor market, they are more exposed to uh, survival sex and all, all sorts of uh, prostitution. We know that uh, during the COVID years, the number of, of very few women in prostitution tripled itself uh, to a couple of hundreds of women, which is in percentage, it's very, very high percentage. The poverty also leads leads women because they have no choice and, and they, they have kids um, and they, yeah, they are not as flexible as the men. They can't uh, you know, change cities as easily, change locations as easily. Um, it brings many women to compromise their living spaces and to live in uh, very small flats with uh, many 
flatmates. So sometimes if they're lucky, it's with other women and their kids, but often it's with other men, relatives or non-relative. And that often creates also non-safe environments and envi environments that don't, in, that don't have privacy for the women and their kids, etc. cetera. Um, another result which, affect, which is relevant to all of, the, all of the refugees but affects women more is the, is the social, uh, um, social isolation. So I touched, again, and it, all, all of these factors, they intersect. So I touched the language acquisition issue and I touched the employment issue. And then it means that the bureaucratic challenges that they suffer are bigger. Um, they, the, the need to, um, they, they often don't own their own bank accounts. They often don't have uh, a salary slip because they work in these type of jobs. So they don't have a salary slip to show to the bank in order to open a bank account. So they, uh, they use their partner's bank account or their cousin's bank account or whatever. And then it means that they can be blocked from their, from their money just one day. So um, all of this form of, of uh, yeah, bureaucratic uh, challenges, um, the social uh, isolation, the dependency on the social environment is, is much, much higher. We're talking about the disintegration of family and community. Of course, again, in all immigration related uh, situations, um, we're talking about this, but here it's, it's especially apparent because when the community is integrating, uh, disintegrating, when people have opportunities to leave, and especially the stronger people have opportunities to leave, because in order to get a sponsorship to Canada, you need to have some resources, not only financial, but also even mental resources. And it's mostly men that are leaving to Canada. And there is a real phenomena of, of men leaving to Canada and then women are left behind with their kids and often with their empty bank accounts. So we're talking about uh, really like disintegrating family in the most literal sense, but also high rates of uh, domestic, uh, domestic violence. And of course, again, all of these factors, they intersect. So we're talking about high levels of stress, high levels of poverty, difficulty to provide for, for the children, which creates a, a very problematic home uh, uh, situation. And then the husband often just abandons either to another country or, to, or just stays in Israel, but, but, but relieves himself from the burden of providing because it's just impossible. There were times that the partners were imprisoned um, and women, women uh, stayed alone to provide for, for their kids. Um, the, the, the decrease in parental authority, of course, again, in all migration situations, because the, the kids, they speak the language, the language better, they know the place better. Uh, the parents sometimes don't have the time, the language, the, the mental availability to manage things vis-a-vis -vis the school, for example. So this is uh, very relevant in all of migration situations again, but when we're talking about vulnerable women, post-traumatic women, uh, women with mental and physical issues, then, then this, this is severe. Uh, of course, this, this problem is, is even bigger, especially when you put patriarchal uh, values, culture, structure of society uh, in the background. Um, and what enhances all of these issues is, is the fact that not only the problems are big, but, all, but the, the assistance is, is very, very small. And I will finish by mentioning this, that the, um, uh, I already said that most of the welfare services are blocked uh, in Israel for refugees because they are not recognized as refugees and they don't hold the residence status. And that means that uh, all of the problems that women suffer being a single mother, being a victim of domestic violence, being a disabled, post-traumatic, uh, torture victim, whatever. Uh, if an Israeli woman suffers from one or many of these things, then you have a whole system. Israel basically has a, still some sort of welfare state characteristics. You have a whole system of uh, allowances and of assistance from the state and the, the asylum seeking women are entitled for almost nothing of this. And even the things that they are entitled, good example is victims of domestic violence. Uh, this is a, a fight that was relatively successful during the years. So officially opening some of the rights and some of the state assistance available for victims of domestic violence, even if they are uh, non-resident, even if they are refugees. They are theoretically entitled, but then in practice, you go back to this bureaucratic maze and to the fact that the, 
uh, when their visa is expired, there is a difficulty to take them into the shelter. They manage in the end, the social workers, but it's an effort every time. Or to get for them the, um, the, uh, the one-time grant that they are entitled to after they finish their time in the shelter. It's in practice, often it, it doesn't work even though they are theoretically entitled to get it. So there's not only lack of rights and assistance, there's also, also uh, lack of ability to realize the very few rights that they are entitled to. Um, and I think I will stop here to allow some time for Q&A. Thank you so much, Shani. I, um, this was fascinating. Um, I'm going to attend now to our questions from the audience. So Alan Benjamin has asked, what is the main current age range of the Eritrean women asylum seekers? Um, and um, Saba Kidane asked a question that actually ties into that, which is also how many Eritreans are there in Israel currently? And what was the number at the peak. So the first is concerning women only, and then the second question um, concerns Eritrean uh, concerns Eritrean refugees in general. Okay. So um, in the peak, there were around sixty thousand uh, African uh, refugees in Israel. The majority were always Eritreans. I think when in the years that we're talking about sixty thousand, so two thousand twelve thirteen, we're talking about something like. 10,000 Sudanese, 50,000 Eritrean. And this is the ratio, more or less. Don't, it's not by a... By the way, the lack of accurate numbers is also in itself uh, an indicator of, of this uh, limbo, deliberate limbo policy that Israel decided on. Today, we're talking about something like 30,000 uh, asylum uh, African refugees, all in all. Um, out of them, something like 5,000 Sudanese and the rest are Eritrean. So let's say around 22, ad, 22,000 adult uh, Eritreans in Israel, uh, 8,000 children, by the way, which are not included in the numbers that I've just mentioned. And out of them, again, estimations only, uh, something like 5,000 women. So out of 22,000, something like 5,000 are women. And are the, this is another question from Alan, um, a follow-up, which is, are the women's um, children able to attend school in Israel? Yes, yes. In Israel, um, there is a, a obligatory free education uh, from the age of uh, three years old. Uh, so it's basically an obligation of the state to, uh, to enroll them to kindergartens and then later schools. But we can talk about all this topic also for hours because the, there are many, many issues. One of the biggest ones is that there is segregation uh, in Israel, not the Yura, but de facto, and especially in Tel Aviv. Most of the refugee, the African refugee children in Tel Aviv are studying in segregated uh, kindergartens and schools. And this has very bad consequences. And of course, also the years between zero to three, which in Israel, you don't have public education in these years. Uh, so when you're poor and you're not entitled to the state subsidized, and they are not, of course, you're not entitled to the state subsidized uh, daycares, then you go to cheap daycares. Uh, and there are special cheap daycares of, the, of foreigners in Tel Aviv, mostly in Tel Aviv, what they call the babysitters. Uh, it became quite famous in Israel because there were uh, several consequent incidents of death of, of toddlers in these babysitters around 2016, 17, these years, 15. Um, so, uh, and the years that they spend in these babysitters, which is still unfortunately the majority of, of refugee children do go to these unsupervised uh, daycares. The years that they spend there, they have their influence. It's tragic. The kids usually get to the public system with uh, education system with with severe gaps. And what is the status of kids born in Israel? This is a question by Rena Panush. Just like their parents. And it's it's a very good question. It's becoming very relevant now. And it's something that that we were very hoping to get some progress with. Uh, with the previous government. In this government, there is no chance. Because I think this is something that it's it, it 
could be quite consensual in Israel, that children that grew up here, even those that, that resist uh, the presence of their parents here, or that think that the government should deport them, or that call them infiltrators, just like the government do, I think that even some of these people will agree that children that grew up here and that they want to contribute to the society and that they finished the Israeli education system, they should have some opportunity to regularize their status and to, and to, to progress with their lives. But right now, when they get to the age of 16, uh, they are the only thing that they are entitled, the only document that they are entitled to issue is this uh, 2A5 uh, piece of paper that you saw. Um, Ella Perkins, this is the second, our second student question, um, is asking if there is no connection to the home country through the third country system. How does the host country decide which countries to, so, so how does that system of the third country work? Who decides which country? And I think that ties into another question about specifically about the Rwanda agreement. So how but I'm not sure I understood the first question. Is it about Israel? Is it about the idea of safe third country, the European idea, the way that Europe I is implementing it? I think it we could focus on Israel um and yeah, and talk about how how does that system work? How do they decide which country to uh, they only managed to convince Uganda and Rwanda. Netanyahu tried. It will depend on, on, on countries willing to make yes. it. Yes, yes, you need to strike a deal. You need to, otherwise the, the countries will not let the people uh, on board the airplane. And uh, once they okay. arrive to these countries, the third countries, what happens to them? What are, what are, what are if you can elaborate a bit, a bit more about these agreements, what happens to them once yeah. they're there? So I must say, I mentioned that in 2018, there was an attempt to do it forcibly and this attempt failed thanks to a very big public uh, uh, outcry uh, that, that uh, surprised, surprised us, the, the activists. It was, it was very big. Tamar probably remembers that uh, Lior and I and many others, we were very much preoccupied with only this and no PhD research for, uh, for a few months during uh, 2018. Um, and, and it was a successful campaign. And Rwanda, in the end, backed off and didn't agree to have a written agreement that says uh, that it's okay to deport forcibly uh, uh, Eritrean and, and Sudanese into its territory. So once Rwanda um, uh, was unwilling to sign such a written agreement and the Supreme Court, thank God, the Israeli Supreme Court was brave enough to say that you at least need to have a written agreement when you, when you declare such a deal. So then the state had to admit, and that happened in April 2018, that they don't have such an agreement, uh, a written one, and that they don't see in any, in the near future, they don't see themselves having a written agreement for forcible deportation. And then it all collapsed, um, the forcible deportation. But then we went back to what we had since 2014, and this is the voluntary departure to these two countries, to Uganda and Rwanda, but I must say that the numbers are very, very small in the past couple of years. Uh, they were small from the beginning. Only a only few hundreds of people were willing to leave to these third countries. Very quickly, they encountered, and that goes to your second question, um, the, what is waiting for them there or what is not waiting for them there. Uh, and of course, when, when you have a dodgy agreement with dodgy motivations and dodgy implementation, then you have dodgy results. They, they they didn't uh, get anything. They didn't get a status. They were pressured to agree to be smuggled to other countries. Most of them, the very majority, there's there are very few people still in um, in each of the countries that, that came from Israel. The very the vast majority of them uh, went on a second uh, refugee refugee seeking uh, refuge seeking journey in Africa. Some of them tried to get to Europe. Some of them tragically drowned in the Mediterranean, some of them are stuck in Libya, all of the, all of the pleasures of uh, being a refugee in, uh, in Africa. And Tatiana, another student question is asking, um, what extent, to what extent does Israel's status as an ethno-national state contribute to the problem faced by Eritrean refugees? Yeah, you have good questions. So that goes back to uh, to me saying that I uh, that I always say that I that I'm not an expert on the on explaining this. I mean, in general, 
first of all, you need to explain all of, as I said, all of the, the, the general uh, Western countries, um, countries dominated by European uh, histories, uh, white countries. You need to explain also their tendency to not want spontaneous um, uh, asylum seekers coming to the territory. And you have also countries that do have resettlement quotas, like Australia, and like the US, that the, the US has the biggest resettlement quota in the world. The US takes, again, if we leave Trump years aside, uh, tens of thousands of refugees from all over the world to resettlement in the US every year, but still doesn't like asylum seekers crossing from Central America, crossing via Mexico into the, into the US. So this, of course, also has a component of wanting order, wanting to control, uh, wanting to, uh, to accept the, the, the refugees, the good refugees, the ones that they want. There's also evidence that countries sort out refugees for a settlement according to religion, according to, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can think yourself, what are countries sorting out people uh, according to what. So countries prefer resettlement over, over spontaneous asylum. So that's in general. Uh, Israel doesn't take resettlement, so that's, uh, also, that's not a good, uh, um, yeah, um, equivalent, but, but, but the, the part of the equation of not wanting spontaneous asylum seekers, definitely like other Western countries. And when you talk about Israel specifically, why is it so uh, still unique compared with, the, with even the, the harshest, the most restrictive other Western countries, then of course you can talk about Israel's geopolitical situation, the, the history, the ethno-national um, uh, ethos and uh, yeah, characteristics of, of the state. Uh, you can talk about uh, racism, you can talk about proximity to Africa, you can talk about collective traumas, I guess. But, by the way, you can, and this is also shared by other countries, you can also talk about um, political, uh, political manipulations and, and votes and finding scapegoats. And, um, you know, this is, again, it's not unique to Israel. Yeah. And um, David Anthony is asking, what is the technical um, terminological status of Eritrean women in Israel? Are they stateless person? Um, can they receive humanitarian aid? Um, they can receive humanitarian aid. They do from human rights organizations in Israel, like those that I'm representing, from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, from other uh, nonprofit initiatives and stuff. Um, they the, their official status, as I said, is just uh, <coughs> protected from from removal. Aganamik Narhaka, Israel calls it. Uh, they they can stay. They get the 205 visa that allows them to stay. And, and if it. they're recognized, how many are they recognized at all as victims of slavery due to the, to the torture camps? Or Yeah, so in Israel, you can only be recognized as a victim of human trafficking and slavery. That's the official status. Um, there are people, there are a couple of hundreds of people that following the stay in Sinai torture camp were recognized, but uh, torture is not enough. So not all torture victims are trafficking victims. And, and in Israel, there is no such status as a torture victim, a recognized torture victim. Until today, there, there, are no, there is no special treatment, uh, not mental, not financial, not welfare, whatever, uh, assistance to, uh, um, to torture victims, but only to human trafficking uh, victims. But now, recently, after many, many years of dragging this, they last week opened a, a mental health clinic in Ichilov Hospital in Tel Aviv, specifically for torture victims from Sinai. Let's see how it will be implemented. Uh, and let's hope that after 15 years, uh, this, the, the mental situation of, of these people can still be improved. Okay, so our time is almost done. I'm going to start to um, squeeze, try to squeeze in one last question from our, our student, Eliana Sisman, who's asking, how much are the labor and women's movement addressing these injustices? How much are they involved? 
It's also a good question. Not as much as I would have wanted. <laughs> it's a topic that is considered very controversial in Israel. Uh, women movement in Israel have their hands full, even even without uh, you know talking about this very specific, rather small group of women. But I must say, I'm in this position. Uh, I'm in my current position, uh, doing policy advocacy for a year and a half now. And I must say that I have a very good, uh, I have I have good allies among the women's organization. And I'm not trying to push them to do what I know that will be too much for them. Yeah. But uh, it's true to the women's organization, to the children's uh, children's rights, the Moatzal Shloma Yelet, for example. So again, I'm not, they will not do anything that is perceived as political, as interfering with Israel's immigration uh, rationales, as risking the Jewish uh, identity of the country, stuff like this. But, uh, but, but there are topics that they will help us and that they are good and important uh, partners. Labor organizations, yes, of course, yes. When it comes to labor rights of of, uh, of refugees, yes, one of the organizations of the forum is Kavla Oved. It's one of the most important labor rights organizations uh, in Israel, and it's officially in the in the forum that I'm representing. So, uh, yeah, the, it's a question that the women the women movement in Israel. By the way, the LGBTIQ movement in Israel, they they are in a special position of of having achievements of making an an amazing progress in the past two decades, but still, and for understandable reason, fearing for their position too much in order to be uh, in in full fledged solidarity with 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 the group that I'm representing. I hope that that what I said is clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of having kind of this fear that if they interfere too much, that might set back some of their um, hard gained um, efforts in terms of right. Um, how do you feel? So this would be the last question. Um, what is so given that you have told us um, through this talk about how much the Supreme Court has been um, helpful in, in, in a few of uh, critical junctures? Um, how do you feel about the judicial reform and its um, and its effect um, on refugee and asylum seeker status um, in Israel? your question or a student it's fine <laughs> it's a good one Yuzi. so what i said in the knesset uh, a few weeks ago when i spoke in the constitution committee is that it's extremely weird for me to be in the uh, to be pushed into the position of defending the high court because what we used to do for the past 15 years is complaining on about the high court the supreme court uh, and the judicial system in israel in general not not, not enforcing the international law that Israel is obliged to, and also, by the way, the Israeli law, the the, the basic law of, of uh, how do you say that in English, even dignity, whatever, yeah. and freedom. <laughs> this basic law, the most important one. So this law, and of course, the Refugee Convention and other uh, international law measures that Israel is committed to, the Supreme Court was never really willing to push Israel back and say, wait, look at what you're doing. I mean, these people, the UNHCR says that they are refugees. Other countries say that they are refugees. The situation of refugees in Israel is radical. It's so, it's so radical that I allow myself to talk in such a non-complex um, way. I say very blunt things, right? And even though we are in an academic setting, and I'm saying it very comfortably, it's a radical situation. And yet the Supreme Court was not willing to, to fix it. It was only willing to draw some red lines. Mm -hmm. That These were the most, uh, the biggest achievements vis-a-vis -vis the High Court in the past 15 years to uh, prevent Israel from crossing some red lines. You can't imprison people that didn't do anything for uh, unlimited periods of time. Wow, amazing. You can't uh, deport people to countries that are not there forcibly if you say that it's, uh, um, uh, how do you say that it's uh, um, voluntary, then you can't imprison them. If it's voluntary, you can't put them in prison for not agreeing to be deported. Wow, radical, right? So the Supreme Court was willing to draw a few red lines. It was almost never willing to um, positively force the state to do something, okay? So it, it, it stopped the state from doing some illegal things, but but not, uh, uh, forcing the state to grant social rights to 
examine fairly and promptly and efficiently asylum requests. Um, so, so our achievements in the court were really um, uh, minimal. And yet, where, where would we have been without them? I mean, the asylum seekers were in prison now or not even here. So, of course, the, the very little protection that the Supreme Court was willing to uh, grant to, to these refugees, it's very scary to lose it. It's very, very scary for us. So, of course, we see ourselves, the organizations, uh, as, as, as part of this, uh, the current campaign against the government's uh, legal uh, reform or yeah, cool. overhaul, <laughs> however, you... <laughs> however you see it. All right. Thank you so much, Shani, for this fascinating talk and for sharing your thoughts and experience with us. Um, I welcome all the audience to, to join me in thanking you. Um, and again, um, thank, thank you for the audience for joining us for this really um, wonderful talk today. Um, this was a talk brought to you uh, by the YNS Nazarian Center for Israel Studies um, in co-sponsorship with UCLA Center for African Studies and the UCLA Center for the Study of International Migrations. Um, we hope to see you all in our next webinar. Um, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.